Well, thank you so much for joining us for another Sunday night. We're so thankful for you. Thankful for you being here with us, joining us online as we continue to press forward in the light of the gospel. Uh, we see the urgency of the gospel more now than ever. And so hopefully you are excited. Hopefully you have brought your copy of the word of God uh, with you as we study together and as we're able to look at some things from God's word that would challenge us, that would help us, that would equip us uh, for the goodness of what he is doing right now. Uh, I, I just am excited about some things coming up in the life of our church. Uh, first of all, September 2nd, I uh, hope that you will be here uh, at the East Campus Worship Center uh, 6 o'clock at night for a business meeting slash prayer service. Uh, going to be an incredible time together as we come together and pray and, and be intentional with our prayers as we seek the face of the Lord and what He is doing during these times and the opportunities uh, that He is putting in front of us. So I hope that you will join us for that. Hope that you'll be there uh, September 2nd at 6 o'clock. I also want to let you know this, September 13th, we're excited about that uh, because that is the time where some of our small group Bible studies will come back on campus as pilot programs to make sure that what we're doing is safe, what we're doing is wise, and what we're doing is, is uh, able to be replicated uh, with more groups that will be coming in eventually. And so we are thankful uh, that God has allowed us uh, to be together. We are thankful that God has allowed us uh, the technology where we can preach openly and speak openly to you. And tonight as we look at Mark chapter 1 and we wrap up finally Mark chapter 1 uh, and we see this encounter with someone who has leprosy. Let's begin as we pray together. God, we love you. And Father, we ask God that you would speak to us through your word. God, that you would help us, Father, that you would guide us, that you would lead us. And and Father, I pray, God, that as we see this encounter with a man of leprosy, God, you, you would be reminding us, Father, of how you came and you've touched our life. You've cleansed us from sin and death. And Father, that we have life in your name. And God, we have been pronounced clean from the great high priest. God, that we have been pronounced righteous, God, in the sight of God because of your work because of your life, because of your death, and because of your life eternal. So, Father, we give you the praise, we give you the glory, and we ask you, Lord, now to encourage us, and, Father, help us to continue to press into who you are. In your name, amen. So, Mark chapter 1, it says this, uh, starting with verse 40, it says, A man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees, If you are willing, you can make me clean. I, I just want us to think about this just for a second. Because the humility and the vulnerability of this man that comes to Jesus, he comes to him on his knees. Now we have to kind of set the scene here for this reality of what this man's life is like. Uh, often with the word leprosy, there's a little bit of disconnection for us because we don't really see a lot of leprosy around us today. But what we have to realize is that leprosy was a skin disease and often uh, it would take people's feeling away so they couldn't feel pain. Uh, it would create boils or, or blisters that would turn white. Uh, and there would be a constant draining of bodily fluids uh, from these wounds and from these sores that would be coming out. Not only that, but uh, those who had leprosy, their face would become very, very um, different looking, swollen in some places, having large crevices. Uh, another thing that would happen is that they would uh, have very, very rough skin and open sores, as we talked about. Uh, another thing that would happen is that often these open sores would produce a distinct smell that was not pleasant. And so someone with leprosy, they were isolated in so many ways. Obviously, the Old Testament commands to put them outside the city, uh, that they would have to call themselves unclean and warn people that they had leprosy. Uh, and so you see a lot of this from Leviticus 13, for example, that covers this issue of how people with leprosy had to live. And so you see that this was a separation. Uh, this was a separating disease that caused them to be in isolation, to cause them to be in loneliness, and caused them to live life that way. In fact, the stories go that many lepers would sit down and they would stand back up and there would be a, a wet spot around the place they were sitting uh, because of the drainage that would be coming out of those open sores. Can you, so you can just imagine the life they lived, the judgment they were looked on with, and you can imagine also the difficulties they had 
building relationships. And so here's this man that comes to Jesus, and I want you to see the posture of how this man comes to Jesus, and that is this. He comes to him on his knees. Now, for a man that's in pain or for a man that has lost the feeling of knowing how to be in pain, those kind of things, and, and it's said that some lepers would be even able to walk in a fire and not know they were being burned because the feeling of pain had lost them or left them. And so what, what happens is this man comes and he, he's there and, and he comes to Jesus on his knees, approaching him very much in humility. And he says, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Now, you also get this account in Matthew chapter 8. So Mark 1, Matthew 8. Matthew 8, the significance of that is, is that it's placed right after the Sermon on the Mount. So Jesus is literally coming down the mountain after teaching the righteousness that must surpass that of the Pharisees and teachers of the law. And he's teaching them to be holy. And then Jesus does something that is absolutely radical in that he encounters a man with leprosy. Not only that, but he touches this man with leprosy. Now I want you to think about this just for a second. The humility of this man to cry out, if you are willing, you can make me clean. I was reading uh, recently uh, a book and it was talking about the training that the Navy SEALs goes through. And the Navy SEALs, they get together and they do something called log training, and it's some of the most intense training. And it's developed that way because the Navy SEALs have to act as if they are one, uh, one life. Even though there may be groups of four to six, they have to act as if they are one life, that they are all moving together as they work with this log, as they do obstacles while carrying this huge log, and they have to make sure. And what is interesting is this, is that as they go through these drills, the, the sergeants and the, and the uh, people that are looking at this and analyzing this, they're looking and they're literally looking to see the micro events that are happening and taking place. They're not so much looking at, did they just complete the obstacle? No, the Navy SEALs are looking to see what about the micro events? What about the adjustments made along the way? How did this group act like one family and one team? And, and you see that some of the adjustments that they make as they're carrying this log, they can feel as if someone is, is struggling behind them. They can feel the struggle happening and they know how to adjust as a team. And I think it's very, very interesting here because what's really happening in that training is that there are vulnerabilities being revealed. There are places of weakness and places uh, of, of vulnerabilities that, that somebody's just being real with the struggle they are going through. And I think it's interesting that this is what Jesus calls us to and he leads us and he invites us into this relationship with him. But it all starts with the same posture that we have this great weakness. We have this great sickness about us. And that we come to him on our knees and on our face before him saying, Jesus, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And I think it's this posture in which we always need to approach the Lord, understanding this, that our flesh and our spirit are constantly at war with each other, that they are constantly battling. And this is what Paul says in Romans chapter 7, the very thing I don't want to do, this I keep on doing. And so we see this sickness within us rearing its head, even though we have been called to the, to the life of Christ and to self-denial. And so we see this calling. And so we come back to the Lord Jesus on our knees saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus was indignant. He reached out his hand and touched the man. I want you to think about that just for a second. Just as those Navy SEALs make the adjustment based on the vulnerability that's been shared on their team, Jesus comes to this man making the adjustment. And he doesn't just meet this man and speak to him. He doesn't just meet this man and see his condition. Instead, Jesus is indignant. Jesus looks with great concern, also angry at the fallenness of the world because he sees the effects of sin and the nature of sin and, and why we have the sickness and, and things interfere with our health and what the fall has done to us. And he meets him, but he doesn't just meet him. He doesn't just carry on a conversation. No, he goes the step that nobody around him thought he would take. And it's this, that he reaches his hand out and he literally touches this man. Now, in that day, that, that would be unclean, and that would be just a, a judgment on Jesus, but instead, his cleanliness is so strong that the man's uncleanliness doesn't affect Jesus. And Jesus encounters this man. He meets him right where he is, sees the posture of this man and how he came to him, and he reaches out his hand to him, and he touches him. And it says this 
It says, so he touched the man and says, I am willing, be clean. Immediately, the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. Can I just tell you the good news of the gospel is this, is that we have a condition that often in scripture is symbolized by the sin or by the sickness of leprosy, and that is sin within us. You know, it's interesting what happens if you see the similarities between sin and leprosy, and then you see Jesus encounter leprosy and the cure that is brought forth. I just want to remind you that in Leviticus 13, it reminds us that leprosy is deeper than the, sin, than the skin. That leprosy would actually infiltrate and go deep within the skin and within the body. And there would be just open sores with these people and, and the priest would be responsible or the somebody in the community would be responsible to look and see just how far infected the body was with leprosy. You see, the same thing is true of sin. It goes deeper than just our actions. In fact, what we see throughout scripture is that Jesus says that out of the heart, the mouth speaks. See, out of the heart, we do things. And what, what it reveals in us is that when we sin, it shows us something about what we believe about God and about Jesus. It shows us what our devotion is really to. And, and so it, it's really a deeper issue. Every behavior is really a heart issue, not just a behavior issue. That's why moralistic deism will never work and never cure us of our problems because what happens in that is that, that we can modify behavior all the time. We can come up with great strategies to modify our behavior, but the issue with us is the heart. The issue with us is inside us and that we need to be a new creation. Just as Leviticus 13 verse 7 says, it says that leprosy starts out small and then it spreads. And what the priest would notice and those people in the Old Testament would look for is that they wanted to see how far the leprosy had spread in a person's body. And the same thing is true for us is that we have to know that sin starts small. Oftentimes we, we just think about things and then before long we put them into action. See, I, I would just ask you this, what are you dwelling on? Are you looking at the positive and the good news of the gospel or has Satan come to you with all the negative that's going on in the world today, all the negative of the news and all the negative of the media that you encounter? Is that feeding your body? Is that feeding your, your thinking and you're not taking the time to renew your thoughts into the word of God? And so that's probably got you confused and that's probably got you in a situation of chaos. And that's just how sin works is that it starts off with just a little thought. James goes through, the, through this. He says that, the sin starts just as a thought and then it gives birth to the action. It gives birth to sin and that when we know it's wrong and we still do it, that's what sin is. And so I would just encourage you in your thought life, in your patterns, that you would just not listen to yourself because often the first thoughts that pop into our head or thoughts even about ourselves are, are very, very negative and coarse in their actions. But instead, I would encourage you talk to yourself. Yes, your pastor is telling you that. Talk to yourself. Engage yourself with the scripture. Make sure that you have an arsenal of scripture to bring to yourself and to remind yourself that you battle with the mind, that you battle with the flesh, that you, you already are ready with the scriptures that God has given you. And so make sure that you think and that you take time to ponder the small things, the small decisions that you are making because often sin like leprosy starts off the small and isolated area and then it takes over. Another thing that Leviticus 13 points us to is that leprosy defiles all it touches. You know, in, in their day, they would have to literally, um, they would literally have to say and point to all the things that they would touch or all the things that they would be around. This is why they had to move out of their home and move out of, outside the city often. And they often had to ring a bell and walk through the city saying, unclean, unclean. And you see that because there was this uncleanliness that would defile anything that they touched or interacted with. As we said, the open sores were everywhere. The infection was getting everywhere. And often they were not even aware of the depths of what they were walking through. And so then you would see that. And so the, the leprosy defiles all it touches and the same as with sin. I want to remind you of the story of, of Achan in Joshua chapter 7. Do you think that he thought just taking a little bit of gold, a little bit of silver and some robes, do you think he thought that would cost him his family? I don't think so. But this is what happens when we have sin in our life and that we are motivated by sin or selfish desires is that suddenly it corrupts everything that we come in contact with or encounter. 
And so I would just encourage you to check that in your life. Another way that sin is like leprosy is that leprosy isolates. It would separate people from their family. It would separate people from those they love the most. In our lives, what happens to us when we are being controlled by sin is that we are often separated from those who love the most. And those that we love the most and that love us the most are often running to us and pursuing us with truth, with accountability, with hard conversations. And so often in our life, what we do is just a reverse is that we shut them out and we continue to satisfy the flesh. And when we satisfy the flesh, it's an appetite. And the appetite gets bigger and bigger and bigger. When I first went to college, uh, I came in weighing something. In my first year of college, I weighed something else. And it was because I kept feeding this appetite, kept feeding it and satisfying it with Little Caesars and Taco Bell, things that were not healthy, things that were not uh, adding nutrition to my life, but instead just fatness and, and heaviness, right? And so you see this dynamic in our lives is that the more we feed a sinful appetite, the bigger it gets and the more out of control it gets until that appetite drives us. And so we have to put our appetite back under control. And what happens is that you watch as people isolate themselves because of sin. Because they fed that appetite, because they found some satisfaction temporarily there, they continue to build and continue to fight on that and continue to walk and pursue those things. And so I would encourage you to watch out when you feel isolated from people, when you start not to be vulnerable as this man came to Jesus in, in humility and vulnerability, we have a tendency to want to preserve our life, preserve our reputation, to save ourselves, And so save ourselves the embarrassment of people really knowing what we're struggling with and what we're walking through. And I would encourage you in this, do the opposite of what your sinful nature would desire you to do. And that is to keep everything in to hold it in, not feel like you can share it, and instead find some Christian believers and in your prayer time, uncover those areas that you were tempted to keep covered so that nobody knows. Because what will happen is, is that the more you cover those things, the more impact and power they have in your life. And then, not only that, but leprosy destines things for the fire. In Leviticus uh, 13, verse 52, it says that anything that what belonged to the leper had to be thrown into the fire. And this is a, an example to us of what sin's ultimate destination is for us, that, that the enemy comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Remember John 15 when it says that we need to abide in him and we'll bear much fruit, but those branches that do not bear fruit, they will be cut off and they will th be thrown into the fire. And so all of this is a reminder to us that just as this man came humbly to the Lord because of leprosy, we come humbly to the Lord because of sin. Now I want to show you the cool prophecy of the scripture of the gospel that happens here. And look at this, found in the law, it says verse 43 of Mark chapter one, Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. Listen, see that you don't tell this to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded you for your cleansing as a testimony to them. And I want you to think about this now. We get this in Leviticus. And so when somebody had leprosy and they were going to be pronounced clean, they had to go and gather two birds. And these two birds, one would be sacrificed and they would take the blood of the one bird and they would put it in this dish, in this, in this pot full of water and full of some other ingredients. And then they would take some of the blood and they would pour it on the other bird on the wings. They would also take the water and, and the ingredients from that pot and they would splash them. They would sprinkle them on the person with le leprosy. I want you to think about that just for a second. That in order for this person to be cleansed from leprosy, they had to go to a high priest who sprinkled them with blood. And then this other sacrifice had to be covered in blood. The blood was poured out and then this blood was poured onto this other bird and that bird was released. And I want you to think just for a second, if you could, that person who had leprosy, is now standing proclaiming, I am cleansed by the blood. I am cleansed by the blood. And as the other bird flew off and his, the blood of that, that deceased bird, the sacrificial bird, as the other living bird flew off covered in the blood of that sacrificial bird, you could see the blood literally sprinkling everything as it flew over. And I want you to think about the gospel going forward in this account. 
that all the law is really about Jesus. It's all really a foreshadowing of it. And so this person coming with leprosy is pronounced clean by having blood sprinkled on them. And what we see in the goodness of the gospel is this, is that God has sprinkled us with his blood. That through Christ Jesus, he is the one that was sacrificed on the cross so that we may have redemption in his name and his name alone. That all the things that came to, to, to dive into our bodies deep, the sin that takes over, the sin that starts small and spreads, the sin that defiles all it touches, the sin that isolates us, and the sin that destines all things for fire. Instead, we are covered by the blood of Jesus, and therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because the law of the spirit of life has set us free. So here's the law of the spirit of life. It set us free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do and that it was weakened by the sinful flesh, God did by sending his son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering, to be that bird that was broken, his blood poured out so that we may be pronounced clean. See, he became sin who knew no sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has left, the new has come. This is the good news of the gospel. This is the hope that we have in Jesus. And it all starts out with this humbling belief, this humbling posture that we come to the Lord with, that we know we're not clean, but if he's willing, he can make us clean. We come at the feet of Jesus and we ask, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. If you've never had that conversation with Jesus Christ, I pray, my, my honest prayer is for you to find yourself, to look at yourself, to see all the uncleanliness and all the ways that you try to make yourself clean is not adding up. It's not working. And then look at the hands and the feet of a Savior that's been pierced for you and know this, that that proves he is more than willing to make us clean. He is more than willing to be our redemption. He is more than willing to draw us in. I'm reminded in 1989, there was a tragic plane accident. Uh, there was a plane that traveled from Chicago, uh, excuse me, from Denver to Chicago, flight 232 in 1989 in July. And what happened was that that this small, very, very small explosion happened in the tail end of the plane. And when that exploded, it, it cut the rudder lines uh, from the control panels inside where the captains would be flying that plane. And so what happened was that it severed the lines, the hydraulics were gone, all this kind of stuff, they could not steer, the plane was flying to the right extensively and they couldn't control it. They couldn't pull it back in. Suddenly everybody on board knows that there's a significant problem because of all the jumping around and turbulence that they're experiencing. They know and the pilots are starting to see that, oh no, we're, we're, we're going to crash in Iowa. We're going down. And so they have all these things happening at once. And there's three men in the, in the cockpit trying to get this back on track, trying so hard to save people's lives. And in the first few rows in first class on that plane happened to be a man named Denny Fitch. And, and Denny, his, his job was actually training pilots in emergency situations. And he told the stewardess, he told her, he said, hey, this is my background. Here's what I do. I, I would love to help. How can I help? And so she took him up to the cockpit of the plane. She told the pilots about this man. And obviously there's chaos going on. There's all kinds of situations. And he simply says this. I'm here. What can I do? How can I help? And in that moment, they started having dialogue of vulnerability. The pilot started saying, I don't know what we can do. What do you all think? The other co-pilot, he's saying, have we tried this? Do you think that would work? In a normal landing, these type of short bursts of interactions happen about 20 times per minute. In this situation, there were exchanges of vulnerability 
there were exchanges at a rate of 60 every minute. So every second, there was an interaction of vulnerability. And that led them to be able to land the plane. Now, started out that there were 285 people on board and 185 lived. But it was an absolute miracle that 185 people walked away from that. And studies have been done that this, this has been recreated in the flight simulators since then. And every time it results so far in absolute destruction and chaos that everyone is lost. I want to ask you a question. For some of you, you're already a believer. You know the gospel. You know Jesus. But have you lost your humility? Have you lost your vulnerability? God, I'm unclean. I need you to clean me. I need you cleansing power. And this acknowledgement that we just stand back in awe and say, because of our admission of sin, because of our admission of guilt, what we deserve is death. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And what we have is this acknowledgement that we say, God, we have been cleansed by the blood. Oh, I pray, I pray that you would know the truth of God's word. And I pray that your testimony would be a humble confession. I was sick. I was dead. I was isolated. I was defiled. But the blood cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Thank you so much. We love you.